wicked men. Though they may seem outwardly to forsake their wickedness, yet if their natures aren't changed, they will be very liable to return to their old wickedness again. A sermon by Jonathan Edwards, based on Proverbs 26, verse 11, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Our text is part of the description of the fool. By fool in scripture, it's meant the same as a wicked man. Wickedness is the greatest folly. And folly and wickedness are used as convertible terms in scripture. It is supposed in the text that a fool, though he remains a fool, may refrain from his folly for a while and seem to forsake it. But if he retains his old principle of folly and wickedness in his nature, he will return to it again as a dog returns to his vomit. Dog is a creature of a filthy nature, delighting in that which is most filthy for his food. He feeds on carrion. His food may offend his stomach, so that he will vomit it up, but he returns and licks up his vomit. This is a most lively emblem of a wicked man who for a time reforms, and seems to be religious, and then returns to his wickedness again. Men are of an impure nature. They delight in spiritual filth, to feed on loathsome food. The impure delight of sin is sweet food to them, and therefore they are called dogs in Scripture. And when a wicked man seems to turn from his wickedness, refrains and outwardly forsakes his sins, if his nature is not changed, he'll return to it again as a dog. Though his stomach for the present nauseates his food, yet, being a dog, still not having his nature changed, he will return to it again seems to be the proverb quoted by the apostle in Second Peter 2, verse 22, and applied to the apostates of his days. The apostle there is speaking of some who had professed themselves to be Christians, and had turned heretics, and fallen away to a wicked course of life, says it happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog returns to his vomit. This is that it certainly signifies the same thing. If a pig is washed never so clean, yet retaining still the nature of a pig, it will still delight as much as ever to wallow in the mire. Doctrine. Wicked men, though they may seem outwardly to forsake their wickedness, yet if their natures aren't changed, will be very liable to return to their old wickedness again. Wicked men, though for a while they may seem to forsake their sins, Yet if their natures are not changed, it will be very liable to return to them again. Proposition number one. Men, without any change of nature, may seem for a while to forsake their sins and to become religious. They may reform past ways of wickedness that they used to live in. If vicious, they may become moral. If profane, they may become religious. They may refrain from the gratification of their lusts. They may escape the pollutions of the world through lust, Second Peter 2.20. They may curb violent appetites. They seem to be pretty thorough in the reformation of a profane and vicious and sensual life. They may put on a face of religion and may attend religious duties with constancy. They may seem to be devout and zealous. They may attend secret prayer and reading and give attention to preaching and watching over their thoughts to avoid sinful thoughts and walk very strictly and exactly, not only openly and when seen by men, but also in secret. Proposition number two. Men without any change of nature may seem for a while to have a great sense of the importance of eternal things and may be earnest in seeking salvation. When John the Baptist preached a little before Christ came upon his public ministry, there were multitudes that seemed to be greatly awakened. They went out to him. All Judea and Jerusalem came to be baptized by him, saying, What shall we do? But yet, when Christ came, the godly were found very thinly sown. And how often 
It is to be seen nowadays that persons for a while will seem to be in distress about the condition of their souls. They will seem to have a great sense of the danger of damnation and their need of getting into a better state, who yet soon lose their convictions and never give any evidences of a change of nature. Proposition 3. Men without any change of nature may be affected with sorrow and grief for their sins. May be affected by reflecting on the injustice and unreasonableness or of the ingratitude of the things they have done or the folly of them. So it was with Saul once and again. Upon hearing David arguing with him of the unreasonableness of his doing as he did, Saul lifted up his voice and wept and said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil, for Samuel twenty four seventeen. So again in chapter 26, 21, Upon hearing David's talk again, he cried, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do the harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. He seems to have a great sense how unreasonably and foolishly he had done. So many others have, without any change of nature, been affected with thinking of their folly in such and such practices, and have accused themselves and seem to be angry with themselves that they should be so exceeding foolish. They have shed tears as well as Saul, who lifted up his voice and wept. That is, he wept aloud. He wept very bitterly. So Ahab, in First Kings twenty one seventeen, upon the preaching of Elijah, he seemed to be greatly affected with sorrow for his sins. And it came to pass, when he heard these words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. Proposition 4. Men without any change of nature may seem to believe the truths of religion. Their assent may for a while be gained by arguments that may be offered. It may seem to them from these arguments that there is a God and the scripture is his word. It may seem that these arguments prove what they allege, or their assent may be gained for a while from some testimony God gives in his providence to the truth of his word, or by an extraordinary pouring out of the Spirit of God, or by some extraordinary judgments inflicted on notoriously wicked men, or by the exemplary lives of the godly, and by the amazing tears of some wicked upon their deathbed, or some instance of a godly man's triumphing over death. Some such instances as these may persuade for a while. It may make it seem to them that there is something in religion. So many in Christ's time seem to be overcome by Christ's miracles. Their ascent for a while was gained, that he was a Christ. They believed in him with a temporary faith without any change of nature. In John two twenty three to 25 when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew all men, and he did not need that any should testify of him, for he knew what was in men. So the young man who came kneeling to Christ to ask what he should do, Mark ten seventeen, to be saved, seems to have been convinced by Christ's miracles that he was a teacher come from God. And he who offered to follow Christ wherever he went, to him Christ said, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. Proposition 5. Men without any change of nature for a while seem to have an affection for God and Christ and therefore may be affected in prayer, and have an affection for ministers, those who preach the word, and have an affection for good people, and have a zeal for religion. He showed an affection for Christ, who told them that he would follow him wherever he went. The stony ground hearers, Matthew thirteen twenty to 21 showed an affection for God and for religion for a while. 
So men who do not have their natures changed may have an affection for the ministers of Christ. So the Galatians have had for Paul, Galatians 4.15, wherein is this blessedness you spoke of, for I bear you record, that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And yet Paul doubted them. Is in verse 11 of that same chapter, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. The Israelites in the wilderness had an affection for God at the Red Sea. And again in Mount Sinai, Exodus 15, 1 to 19. When Moses read the book of the covenant in the audience of the people, they replied, All that the Lord has said we will do, and we will be obedient. But what did God say when Moses returned their words to him? Deuteronomy 5.29 Oh, that there were such an heart in them, that there were such a heart in them that would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Thus far may men go without their natures being changed. But second, then they will be very liable to lose things and return to their old wickedness again. If men who have lived wickedly reform their lives, it is not common to persist in a thorough reformation of all sins unless their natures are changed. Their lusts may be restrained and held in for a while, but unless they are mortified, they will break out again. They must have some vent. Men, after a while, will get into the same or other ways of gratifying their lusts. There is a difference between refraining from sin and taking leave of it. Those who do not have their natures changed may refrain from sin, but they never forsook and abandon it. The Apostle Peter speaks of those in his time who had escaped the pollutions that are in the world through lust and were entangled therein, Second Peter 2.20 and applies them to this proverb in verse 22. It happened to them according to the true proverb. Judas for a while ceased his covetous dispositions. He seems with the rest of the disciples to have forsaken his temporal goods to follow Christ. When Peter said in Matthew 19:27, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee, he included Judas. But Judas is covetous, not being mortified, his nature not being changed. His covetous broke out again, and therefore he was vexed. Christ allowed Mary to spend the precious ointment that they might have made a gain of, and the reason is given for it that he was a thief. And though Judas seemed to sell all for Christ at first, yet at last he sold Christ for thirty pieces of silver. Matthew 25, verses 14 to 16. If men have a sense of the importance of spiritual and eternal things, if they have had great convictions, they'll cease after a while if men's natures aren't changed. Men may have fears and be exercised about the state of their souls a long time, but it is but seldom that men have great convictions hold unless they are converted. It is not usual for strong convictions to be perpetual unless they issue in a change of men's natures. So if men seem violent for the kingdom of heaven and are very much engaged in this work, this doesn't ordinarily hold unless God changes their natures. Objection. We see some who are for a long while seeking salvation. Some seek for 20 years together. Some seek all their lives, and that without any change of nature. Answer. It is true. Some continue doing something a long while without any change of nature, but these usually deal with a slack hand. Their convictions are not thorough, neither are they violent. It is rarely, if ever seen, that any are perseveringly violent for the kingdom of heaven unless their natures are changed. They are wont after a while to grow weary and slack. Their hand to be more dull and partial. They are weary of the fatigue of traveling in a wilderness. They begin to think after a while of turning back into Egypt. 
Some temptation or other prevails upon them to allow themselves more ease and liberty. It may be they are discouraged and think it will be in vain. They begin to doubt whether or not there is any such thing as conversion, and why should they strive for that? They don't see that they have gotten any further than when they set out. It seems to be labor in vain. They think it is not worth the while to deprive themselves of that ease and pleasure that others enjoy for nothing. And so they begin to think again of the pleasures of the world. Or it may be that they flatter themselves that it is well with them. They think something they have experienced is conversion, and there is no need to take any further care about it. So that faith, a belief of the word of God men may have, won't hold unless our natures are changed. If their assent is gained for the present by some new argument, fine discourse, or remarkable providence in which God testifies to the truth of his word, the force of that will be soon over unless men's natures are changed. Unbelief is yet in its principle whole in them. And as soon as the first impressions are over, that will return upon them. They won't steadily realize the great truths of religion so as to be governed by such a belief. If all under the fresh impression of something remarkable, they assent. Yet their doubts and objections will soon return and prevail. We read of those in Luke 8.13, who for a while believed, but in a time of temptation fell away. We read of many in Christ's time who were said to believe, who were persuaded by Christ's miracles. But we read of none continuing in their faith, but those who were true disciples and converts. Many of them had their faith overthrown only by Christ's teaching. They could not understand about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. John 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walk no more with him. So men sorrow for their sins, though they may be much affected, and may seem much to condemn themselves, won't last unless their natures are changed. Saul wept for so unreasonably treating David, but yet the next news we hear of Saul is that he is pursuing after David again. So natural men's affections and illuminations aren't lasting things. The children of Israel were greatly affected at the Red Sea, but they soon fell to murmuring against God. They were affected at Mount Sinai, when Exodus twenty four sixteen to 18 they see the miraculous tokens of God's presence there. Yet in a few days after, they made a golden calf, Exodus 32. So the hearers represented by the stony ground hear the word, and anon with joy received it, but by and by they are offended. A man without a change of nature may seem to have a love for God and Christ and zeal for him, but such love will soon fade away and turn to hatred. Thus it is with all the goodness of unconverted men. It is not lasting. Hosea 6 verse 4, Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it passes away. Reason number one is from the powerfulness of unmortified corruption. Nature is a more powerful principle of action than anything that opposes it. Nature, whether it is corrupt nature or sanctified nature, is powerful and will overcome other things. If nature is not changed, it is a difficult thing to overcome. Nature may be restrained and hindered for a while, but it won't be conquered. The stream of a river may be stopped for a while with a dam, but it cannot be stopped always. It will have a course there or somewhere else. When natural men reform their lives, deny their lusts, and live a strict and religious life, and are painful and earnest in religious duties, it is not natural, but it is against nature. It is forced against nature. Now, it may be observed in all cases that a force upon nature is not constant. It may be maintained and kept up for a while, but nature at last will get the victory. So natural men may, while under an impression, and while the strength of a resolution lasts, 
restrain corrupt nature, but that will carry them away at last. Reason number two. Nature is a thing that is more constant and permanent than any of those things that are the foundation of a carnal man's reformation and righteousness. If a natural man has received some impression by something in the word or providence, that impression, though it may seem to be deep at first, it continually grows less and less till at length it wears out. But nature remains still in its full force. If natural men are under conviction and have a sense of hell and God's wrath, and of the shortness of life, such a sense won't be constant unless it has its foundation in nature. It is only at times and upon certain occasions that a lively sense of these things is revived, and there will be times when a man will seem senseless. He won't have the idea so lively. He'll be in a senseless frame. But then nature will be as vigorous and powerful as ever. Never will be dormant as long as it remains. And then at such times it will be in danger of carrying men away for all their convictions. If men have taken up resolutions, if their natures aren't changed, that will prove a more steady thing than their resolutions. It will outlive them and will take an advantage against him when his resolution is decayed and weakened and will overcome him. Nature is a more steady, permanent thing than men's affections. Affections are transient, vanishing things. They are like a blast of wind and vanish like a shadow. And then, when men's affections are over, then nature returns in its full force. As long as corrupt nature is not mortified, but the principle is left whole in a man, it is a vain thing to expect that it should not govern from their want of a right on God's covenant. Reason 3. If men's natures aren't changed, they will be very liable to return again to sin, because God has not promised to assist such. If God doesn't assist, men's resolutions will signify but very little. If God doesn't maintain impressions and convictions by His Spirit, they will vanish away. But there is no promise of any such thing to any unregenerate man. God has promised that he will afford his assistance to enable the godly to persevere, and that they shall persevere, John 10:28. My sheep shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 9. Who shall confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. God is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And many other such like promises there are, but there is no such promise with respect to the unconverted. We will show in some instances how that nothing will secure a man's not returning to his old wickedness again, unless his nature is changed. Number one, the most powerful outward means won't do it. Let a man live under never so powerful a ministry and have hell set before him after never so awakening a manner or if he has never so many warnings from his friends, if he sees never such awful warnings in providence, if they see others die, others who have been their companions and acquaintances, if they frequently see instances of sudden death, if they have been warned by them upon their death beds, lamenting their wickedness and their neglect of their souls, such things as these may have an effect upon men, for the present may awaken them, and make them afraid to go on in sin. But this will be no security against his return and again to his sins. This is found by very frequent experience of the apostles, yea, of Christ himself. Yea, if men should see miracles, that would not do. Hearing God might make them avoid their sins for a while, but it would not secure their not returning to them again, such things as have often been tried and found unsuccessful. 
How many miracles did the children of Israel see in Egypt? In what a wonderful manner did God deliver them from their bondage there? How incredibly were they delivered at the Red Sea when God dried up the sea before them and drowned Pharaoh and the Egyptians? Yet all this had no effect upon him. But after a while, while they presently fell to murmuring and repenting that they had left Egypt. And then what a wonderful sight did they see at Mount Sinai. What manifestations of the presence and awful majesty of God. They were greatly affected for the present, but they quickly turned away again. Exodus 32, 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them, and have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and sacrificed there, and said, These be your gods, O Israel, which have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And how they continue provoking God to anger from time to time, though they were led and maintained by a continual series of miracles. They had the pillar of cloud and fire going before them constantly. Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22. And lived upon manna and water out of the rock. Exodus 16, 17. In Joshua's time, they had seen the sun stand still. Joshua 10, 13. But when Joshua was dead, they returned to their wickedness. And we have examples again in Christ's time. How many miracles did they see then that he wrought? And yet many of them that had believed on him went back and walked no more with him. How many miracles did Judas see of Christ's working? And yet that did not keep him from backsliding. If one should rise from the dead, Luke sixteen thirty one. If men should hear God speaking to them with an audible voice and warning of them against their sins, telling them of their danger. This might make them afraid to commit sin for a while, but it would not secure them. The children of Israel heard God speaking to them out of the midst of the fire with an awful and majestic voice that made them all to tremble. But yet in a while they turned aside to idolatry. Exodus 20, verse 19. If men should see never so great, terrible, and miraculous judgments upon others. God should strike other wicked men dead in a miraculous manner when in the act of their wickedness, and they should be eyewitnesses of it. This might make them afraid for a while to go on, but it would not secure them without a change of nature. What judgments did the children of Israel undergo in the wilderness? He inflicted them from time to time upon those who sinned. They saw how dreadfully God punished many of them for their making the golden calf, when he commanded every one that was his brother, and they did so. But notwithstanding this, they soon fell to murmuring again at Tabera. Numbers 11.3 There the fire of the Lord burned among them. But the next news we hear of them was that they fell a lusting and loathing manna. And then they saw how the wrath of God was kindled against them, and he smote them with a very great plague while the flesh was between their teeth. But yet soon after they murmured and behaved themselves exceedingly provokingly at the relation of the spies. And then see how God swore in his wrath that they should never enter into the land. And God executed this. He bid them turn back by the way of the Red Sea. Yet this did not cure them. But after this we hear of the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And then the children of Israel see how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed some of them up. Numbers 16, 31. And others were consumed by a miraculous fire that God kindled among them. But yet this did not cure them. But on the morrow we are told in Numbers 16, 41, all the congregation murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And when they see how God smote many of them down dead with a miraculous plague. But after this they murmured again against Moses and Aaron. And then God sent fiery serpents amongst them. But yet after all this, Numbers 21, 6. And after they had seen how God caused them for their wickedness to wander forty years in the wilderness. And had in the meantime consumed all the men of war that came out of Egypt with a great mortality. Yet how guilty were they again in the matter of Peor. These things, Numbers 21, 1. 
make it abundantly evident that the most awful judgments won't do to keep men from returning to ways of wickedness unless their natures are changed. Very agreeable to these are the accounts we have of the children of Israel afterwards in the time of the judges and before the destruction of the land of the Assyrians and Chaldeans, how they were warned by the prophets. The children of Israel saw how that God had destroyed their brethren of the ten tribes, but this did not avail to keep them from the like wickedness and from doing worse than they. Number two, there are no providences either merciful or afflictive, toward the persons themselves that will secure their not returning to the wickedness without a change of nature. What great mercies had God bestowed on the children of Israel? He brought them out of Egypt. He divided the Red Sea for them. He led them by a pillar of cloud, gave them manna, water out of the rock, made them his own peculiar people, bringing them into Canaan, subduing the nations before them. He made the sun stand still. When they waxed fat, they kicked and lightly esteemed the rock of their salvation, Deuteronomy 32, verses 13 to 16. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kind and milk of sheep, with fat lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats, with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape, but she sure and waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. Let what mercy soever be bestowed on wicked men, Though they may be affected with gratitude for the present, yet it won't effectually teach them righteousness. Isaiah 26.10 Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Men are sometimes affected a while when God has in some way remarkably spared their lives delivered them in a fit of sickness, or spared the lives of their children, but they return again to their old ways of wickedness. If God corrects men and brings judgments upon them, brings them into great danger of their lives, this won't secure their not returning. If God brings some terrible affliction upon them, it may make them serious and solemn for a little while, but there is no dependence upon its lasting unless the nature is changed. Isaiah 1 verse 5 why should you be stricken any more? will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. That is the case. Number three. Wicked men, unless their natures are changed, will be liable, though they expose themselves never so much by it. For example, though they may be old and according to nature's ordinary course can have but little time to live, Yet if they have no change of nature, they will be liable, after refraining, to return again to ways of wickedness. There are not many such instances of persons advanced in years who live in a negligent and carnal life. The common work of God's Spirit won't do it. Number four. If men have been exercised with very great terrors about hell, that is no security against their future returning to their sins. The greatest terrors that men have are liable all to pass away, and men who now seem to be in amazing fears of damnation in a little time may be secure in sin. This is often seen in those who have been sick. When their lives were hanging in doubt before them, they will seem to be in amazing terror. But if, beyond their expectations, they are restored, you will very commonly see them as secure and careless as ever again. That corrections and judgments and terrors won't make men to forsake their sins is agreeable to the observation of the wise man in Proverbs 27:22. Though thou should bray a fool and no mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his folly depart from him. Number five. Men's own promises and resolutions won't do it unless their natures are changed. When a man's nature is changed and his resolution arises from that, then his resolution may be steady. It has a strong foundation that it stands on. But if nature opposes it, it will prove to be a building on the sand, Matthew 7:26. Nature will be likely to undermine it. 
This also is often seen in them who have been sick. What resolutions will they sometimes take up? What promises will they make that if it pleases God to spare their lives, they will forsake their sinful ways and will live better? and will make it their great care to seek the salvation of their souls. But how often are such resolutions and promises broken? Here I would observe, before I proceed to the application, it may be more often seen that men without any change of nature may reform a particular sin finally. Yea, they may finally reform all ways of more open and notorious wickedness. They may be, as long as they live, be what appears to the world to be orderly, moral, and religious. But it rarely, if ever, happens that men persevere in a thorough and universal reformation and abstinence from all ways of wickedness. Their sin and corruption will have its vents and outlets one way or another. Many who seem to be moral, orderly men have their ways of wickedness for all that. If the stream is stopped from running in a channel that it used to, yet it will run somewhere. It will have a new channel if the old one is not stopped up. There are hundreds of ways that men may live in that may be marks of the rottenness of their hearts, and yet they may be in no way vicious as the term is generally used. They may be moral and orderly as to what is seen by the world. There are other spots that are not the spots of God's children that yet are not so exposed to the eye of the world as that men may know them by. Men may seem to go on in a thorough outward righteousness until there comes a notable trial as God is wont to give all men their trials. Yea, they may stand one trial or two, but it is one thing in war to have the better at the onset, but they won't conquer in the battle. They'll yield at last. Application All natural men, however reformed and affected, are under the dominion of sin. Use 1. Hence learn what bondage natural men are under to sin. This may show us Christ's meaning in John 8, 34. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that commits sin is a servant of sin. And we have that of the apostle in Romans seven fourteen. I am carnal, sold under sin. And there is that of the prophet in Jeremiah seventeen nine. The heart is desperately wicked. It is so under the power of sin that the case is desperate as to their ceasing from sin unless their natures are changed. Jeremiah 13, verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? As long as an Ethiopian is an Ethiopian and his nature hasn't changed, he'll have that skin. As long as a leopard is a leopard and he isn't changed into some other sort of creature, he'll have those spots. So wicked men, until their natures are changed, won't forsake sin. Wicked men are ready to look upon a life of holiness as a bondage. They look upon it as a bondage to strictly observe such and such rules and abstain from all the gratifications of their lusts. But what we have heard teaches who they are that are in the most bondage. Their lusts are their masters and they are too strong for them. They are bound by them as it were in chains that they cannot break. They are kept by them in that slavery in which they will surely perish if God doesn't give them liberty. Such men are greatly mistaken when they imagine that the godly are in bondage and that they enjoy their liberty. The Jews were mistaken when they told Christ that they were Abraham's children and were never in bondage to any man, John 8, 33. Use number two. Hence learn that it must be the work of God, not of sinners, to make men holy. It can't be done without a change of nature. But it is impossible that man should change his own nature. It is absurd to suppose this is as impossible as that which Nicodemus spoke of, that a man should enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born. John 3, 4. Man can no more renew or change his nature than he could give himself a being, or that a child should be the cause of its own conception and birth. That which changes a man's nature must be something distinct from that nature which is changed. It must be something above nature. There is necessity of the exercise of the power of him who gave man his nature at first to change him from sin to holiness. You three, how little worth the religion of those men is who never experienced any change of nature. If men acting upon natural motives and moral principles are just and righteous in their dealings, faithful and exact to their word, honest to fulfill their bargains, careful not to wrong any man, to live only upon their own, if they are good neighbors and kind to all who want their help, 
generous to the poor, if they are public-spirited men, such things as these may be what some may trust in, but they are of little significance unless men have experience and a change of nature. So if men are conscientious and constant and devout in religion in their closets and families, and in the house of God are forward to promote any religious design, and have a zeal against wicked men and labor to promote the things that are good, there is no great account to be made of those things unless men can tell of their experience in a great change in their hearts and a renovation of their natures. Unless there is such a change passed upon them that old things are done away and they have become new creatures, of carnal, have become spiritual, of earthly, are made heavenly, Unless they have experienced the power of God within, giving them new hearts, it is worth little because it has no sure foundation. There can be no dependence upon it. Such a man for all his righteousness is liable to be the worst and wickedest man who lives. Men from natural principles, from a sense of honor, from education, from love to their temporal interest, from conscience have gone a great way. There were many of the heathen philosophers who greatly excelled in many moral virtues, and many professing Christians make a fine show upon the same principles, but they are but washed swine that have the same filthy, swinish nature still within them, however clean their outside appears, and they are liable again to return to wallowing in the mire. Let none therefore amongst us make much of any of their religion or righteousness, if they know nothing of any such change of nature that has passed upon them. Men may be greatly altered outwardly and in the course of their lives without a change of nature. Reason and conscience may work great effects, but there is a difference between a change of customs and a change of habits arising from custom and a change of natures. This change of nature appears, number one, in the change of men's understandings. There is a new principle of perception. Objects are seen that were hidden before the eyes of their understandings are enlightened. When this change of nature is wrought, the eyes of one who has been born blind are opened. The excellence and gloriousness of spiritual objects is seen that before appeared without any divine glory. The understanding receives new conviction. Things appear true and real that before appeared fabulous or uncertain, or at most but probable. There are many marks of truth seen that are powerful with the heart to convince and satisfy it. Divine doctrines now seem true and real. There shines a light now from the word of God that is an evidence to men of its being from God. So before retained as unbelief, all the arguments that were offered are now susceptible of conviction. Arguments now have their weight and force. Yea, they sometimes see things in such a manner that they need no arguments. Number two. A change of nature appears in a new savor and relish of things, and new appetites and aversions. Those things now suit their natures that were contrary to them before. Divine doctrines, the doctrines of the gospel about the sovereignty of God, about the way of salvation, they now are agreeable and pleasant to the taste. They have a relish of them that before they could see nor taste nothing of. It was perfectly insipid to them, they have a new relish for the word of God, for the holy and sublime and spiritual doctrines of it. They are natural to them, agreeable as mother's milk to a babe. They who have a new nature have new appetites. Those things that they had an aversion to before, they are now naturally inclined to them. Their soul hungers and thirsts for them as for more spiritual knowledge, more acquaintance with God, more communion with more holiness, being more like God, living to the glory of God and bringing forth more fruit. They delight now in new things. They delight in religious duties. They delight in the word of God and in ordinances as means of conversing with God. They delight in those things that have a near relation to God. They delight in holy actions, in God's ways. It seems a pleasure to them to do justly and righteously, and as God commands. A holy life seems a pleasant and happy life that before seemed a bondage. And always the sin are loathed and abhorred for that reason, because they are sinful and against God. Change of nature appears in this change of the relish or appetite. If a pig should cease to delight to wallow in the moire, or the raven to feed on carrion, why would we argue justly that their natures were changed? Number three, 
The change of nature appears by the new principle of action as what they are enabled to do. They have a principle of action in which they are enabled to do those things that they were utterly dead to before. They are sometimes enabled to venture their souls upon Christ, exercise love to God and humble delight in God, to seek the glory of God. They are enabled to abase themselves and exalt God in their heart, to make themselves nothing and God all. Use 4. How little those men's pretenses are to be regarded who pretend to the experience of a work of conversion, but return to wicked ways. This evidence is that they are some of the sort who are like the dog that returns to his vomit again. This shows them to be some of that sort that are mentioned in Mark 4:17, who endure for a while, but afterward fall away. Their work that they tell of was no change of nature. It left the same nature in them that it found them in. The Apostle John says of some in his time, 1 John 2.19, They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained. Consider that God has said, If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hebrews 10.38 You are one of those spoken of in Luke 14.29 and 30, who began to build, but were not able to finish. See what God says by the prophet in Ezekiel 18.24 but when the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live. All his righteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he has trespassed and in his sin that he has sinned, in them shall he die.